Dickens. Who no, I don't like Dickens. Dickens. But uh, who do you get besides, uh, uh, what's his name, who wrote uh, Lavengro, Lavengro? Lavengro. Yeah. Who well, Lavengro is the greatest of the, of the early Victorians. He is actually, what, a post Austin, Jane Austen. Yes, he's post-Austin. Now, yeah. Jane Austen, of course, is the greatest novelist in the English language. Well, right? she's a great novelist, but not the greatest. Not the greatest. I'm a Dickens man. Um, well, Dickens is messy, George. Of course he's messy, but he's lively. He only wrote one mm -hmm. great book, which is Pickwick Papers. I would put that way down compared to what? Bleak House. The place in Lincolnshire, no, Lady no. Dedlock. Yes, Lady Dedlock. Sure. Oh, I think she's so, so unreal. Oh, walking through the uh, wet. I, I think you should avoid superlatives, but probably one of the very great novels in the English language is certainly Tom Jones. Yes. Now that's right. The test is this. I think I would agree with that one. Yeah. That. A book is great, which you can open anywhere, and it immediately, you can't stop reading. And then after a while, you say to yourself, gosh, I better go back to the beginning and read this book. I always like Henry James's crack about Tom Jones. He said, it was so vivid, it was almost as if he had a mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think I think Henry James tends to be tedious, and, and uh, uh, I, I don't know what what would you say, for instance, the Americans. Uh, well, the Americans is a rather a bogus situation, I think. Well, it is. It's right here. Yeah. You're at the Tremont House, across yeah. from the Athenaeum. Yeah, it's and you're the looking old here house. at the graveyard, yeah. and I think that the scene is laid in the Codman House in Lincoln. It, it almost seems oh, really? as if it that were. Might be, it it yeah. almost seems as if it were. Because what other, what other magnificent Federalist house can you think of within 20 miles of Boston? Well, there might be some at Salem. A country no, house. No, 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 no but there are Salem houses. Yeah, no, yes. that's a country house. They're all yeah. townhouses. But there no. is Gore Place in Waltham, and then, of course, there is the... the uh, yeah. The well, I don't place. think the Europeans, though, I think it has some amusing moments if Henry James is greatest or anywhere near it. Yeah. Well, now, what do you think is his best novel? The Wings of the Dove. Well, that, I can always say, is like a thick fog <laughs> off the glade. <laughs> <laughs> Without a compass. <laughs> Without a compass. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. But who else do you get? I I can't think. One of these great people, I, I'm always told that I should be enthusiastic about, but I'm not, is uh, Hardy. And I get very little out of Hardy and I don't like all Hardy. that uh, fatalism Hardy in Wessex. It's failingly uh, disagreeable. Yeah. And I don't think that you're going to make uh, world renowned by being disagreeable. The only trouble with Proust, though, is he's very good at the beginning and the end, but there are awful lengths of tedium in Albertine Disparu. Oh, Lord, the, 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 uh... <laughs> <laughs> when he's it? being a snob, he's best. He, yeah. When he's being himself, <laughs> yes, he's, yes. he's best <laughs> as a snob, <laughs> and certainly Combray is, is, is great. Yes. Sure. But Begins but great. Yeah. But Albertine, I can't go for. But at the uh, end, when he gets back to being snobbish again, I think, uh, I and Baron de Chalus and all that. Oh, yes. Terrific. That <laughs> <laughs> that's social as hell. That's so social, all you right. You still have a lot of cocktail parties? Or no. You'll be very interested to know that the younger generation does not drink. I know. Well, I've heard and, that. Uh, yes. It's very interesting. And you'll also be interested to know that, that uh, the grandchildren of Mrs. Cox don't drink. 
Don't, that is amazing. It is amazing. Considering <laughs> their <laughs> inheritance. <laughs> uh, that it's a very interesting development. They don't play bridge and they don't drink. What else have they got to live for? They, well, sex, probably. <laughs> well, <laughs> doubtless sex. They keep that very quiet. Yeah. But they play tennis a great deal. That I'm all in favor of, except it gave me my heart attack. Yeah. <laughs> well, the difference is, George, that they play tennis. We used to bat the ball back and forth across the net. Mm -hmm. uh, these they've all been trained. They've been trained, the and yeah. it's very important. And as far as I can make out, that's the only thing they care about for their children, is they should mm. be good tennis players. How about sailing? Well, this is what distresses me very much. Uh, it may be the hurricanes, I'm not quite sure, but uh, every now and then a boat cracks up because of a hurricane, and then that discourages people. It's very expensive to replace it. We used to always get them into well, we used Cohasset to, We before. used to s take them in to Cohasset. Now the idea seems to be that you leave them at their mooring, and you insure them, and you rather hope that they will break away. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Charlie, I remember, <laughs> never insured a boat. No, do you remember we were sailing once with him in a race off Marlborough Head, and the spinnaker was set, and the main sheet was way out. And suddenly, just gently just like that, folded over. The I was sails on board, went yeah. over <laughs> the bow, and gradually the boat came to a stop. And cousin Charlie stood up with his tiller between his legs and said, "Well, boy." I've saved a lot of money in my time <laughs> by never <laughs> insuring anything about a boat. <laughs> there was $10,000 yes. in, in the waves around Still, him. Still, <laughs> but he must think of what he must have but saved. think of what he must have saved yeah. over his long years yeah. as a racing man. Mm. No, I uh, am very concerned about sailing because I love to sail. The only thing I can tell you is that, that uh, the interest in the water continues. My son Dougie and his son and a friend went out canoeing last weekend. Canoeing? Canoeing. Canoed up the Sally Winder, towing their boat at low tide. Well. The following morning had to fight their way across the Sally Winder because it was blowing hard from the northwest oh, yeah. and they barely made it. And uh, so we still are very rugged at the Glade. Yes, but you haven't got as many. You don't have as many boats in the water. Sailors, no, huh? no, no. Now tell me about since you've deserted us and gone to live in Canada and so in Quebec. Quebec, Quebec. Yeah. Uh, what the hell do you do in Quebec? Well, in summertime. It's same. Um, I understand from your from uh, Nancy that that you eat potato chips, and that's very bad for the heart. Well, but that's a minor activity and so on, but it's first of all, all you did. it's love. Well, I'm, that got me into trouble, I think, but it's first of all a lovely country with a lot of lakes, and I used to have a boat there, but uh, Nancy finally revolted and said she would no longer lie up on the forecastle catching a mooring, so that did that in, because oh. uh, I couldn't do it by myself. It's big enough for that. You speak of the glade. I have to tell you that, that your daughter Susie is the greatest addition you have well, to the glade in a generation. Woman, yeah. She's a wonderful person, mm. and her innumerable children now are all growing up. They're all very charming, and the only thing that's disagreeable is something called Rufus or something, the dog. Rufus. Rufus? I think What's so. his name, anyway? Volpus? He's a terrible a terrible animal. animal. Every Why time that? he sees me, he bursts into nasty barking. Yeah. <laughs> he snarls at me, yeah. and I curse him, and then he barks all the louder. Yeah. But Susie's great, I agree. She's a great I girl. I think Arch is an original, but not a very social original. Well, 
I don't understand art. Uh, we call him the melancholy Dane <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> actually he's a melancholy Dutchman. <laughs> he may be Dutch, but uh, uh, he's almost always observed. Uh, either turning over a rock mm. looking for little snakes. That's right. Yeah. Or else he's down <laughs> with a fish net. I don't mm. know what he's doing, but he never seems to have anything in his pail. He loves natural history. He loves natural history, time. and he's a very attractive fellow, and whenever he speaks to you, it's charming, but he almost never speaks, speaks. to you. He never speaks to you. Yeah. He, he uh, raises his hand in, in salutation as I jolt across Wattles Beach, but he doesn't stop to he doesn't uh, stop whatever he's doing to pass a few minutes talking about Swift, yeah, which is his expertise. Now, George, I have a very early recollection, very early. I couldn't have been more than four or five years old, and I was walking across the green with my father, and it was the evening. And I said I wanted to go up there, pointing up to the, where the Homans family were then living. Yeah. And my father said, no, you don't want to go up there. Just like that. Just like that. No explanation. <laughs> no explanation. <laughs> I didn't go up there. <laughs> so that's mm. my earliest recollection of you and your family. <laughs> I was forbidden. And like all forbidden things, I was attracted to it. Well, of course, uh, my ma couldn't stand it at the Glades. She hated the communal well, living. The communal life was perfectly awful. So we left for several years at Marblehead and various other places. But finally, uh, her children had such a good time at the Glades, visiting Aunt Fanny yes. and people like that, that we insisted literally, that we should it, come we back. We should come back to the yes, Glades. Yes. Yeah. And I've never regretted it. I thought we had a wonderful time. Of we still miss yeah. you, Joel. Yes, yeah. We still miss you, but we're glad to have Susie with us. Yes, well, Susan more than makes up for... She has a good nature, which I never did. She yeah. has a very good nature. Yeah. She's mm. very, very charming and attractive girl. And she's got sense about things like money, too. That's something we all would like to have, have more. but don't. No. No, see, you do, but I don't. No. And they say, I have nothing but cash. Nothing but cash? Nothing but cash. Really? Now that is... And that yeah, interests me yeah. very much. I, I'm inclined to think, I always remember back when you and I were very young and, and the Great Depression was at its worst. I remember a fellow I was at that time trying to pedal Waltham watches. I remember, I remember how I used to throw them on the floor. Yes, that test was them. great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I remember I went down to to uh, Lowell to sell watches at Christmas time, 1930. Seven. That yeah. was in the so-called recession. You might as well have tried to peddle Frigidaires to the sure. Eskimos. Yes, yes. And there was another fellow with me, and I remember after a very discouraging day, I remember him saying, well, Tom, you've got just two friends in this world, yourself and your dollar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can't carry cynicism much <laughs> further than that. Well, my fa father used to say, in good times we're ruined by the bankers, in bad times by the politicians. So that was his doctrine. That was your father's doctrine. <laughs> your father was a very wise man. But now, of course, I think we could say with some truth that we're ruined by the lawyers. I think you've got a lot uh, there. Yeah. And, but why did these idiot bankers lend so much money? Did, did they really think they were going to get any of it, or oh, some of it back I, I to don't their know. South American republics? Yeah. This is, the, this is the, the great financial question, I think, of our time. Oh, it's terrible, the loads. Uh, 
lying on It's that. easy for us to say now, it, how could people have been such fools yeah. as to lend all that money to the Germans? Yes. In order that they could pay reparations to the French, who would then pay it to the Americans. Yes, yeah. And it went round and round yeah, and exactly, round, and one yeah. day it stopped, and you had the Great Depression. Depression. That's right. Now, we've got, well, we've lent all our liquid cash down there, yeah. and what liquid cash we didn't have, well, we didn't have any liquid cash, so now Mr. Reagan has, is borrowing money. Oh, Huge sums. Um, We've just passed the two trillion mark. I know, and this control that has been devised on on the debt and on the budget, you know, you can't work that one. It won't work. You no. talk to your friend Paul Samuelson and all those fellows, and they talk about the gross national product. Mm as if the gross national product meant a damn thing, because all it is is the velocity of money, and the more you, well, well, particular items get counted in over and over, over and over and over, over again. again. And you take something as like fast as possible as can. Possible, yeah. Now, in the meanwhile, I'm rather enjoying myself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you're quite right, and uh, I think Uncle Henry was a pretty good prophet in many ways. Uh, he didn't realize how quickly the scientific uh, development would um, come to destroying the world, but he had the notion in his mind. Yeah. Mm. You know, I, uh, I'm very interested in historical my theory being that, that if you knew enough about history, you would be able to predict the future. Oh, I don't believe that for a minute. Well, I know you don't, John. No. But when I talk enough, I mean if you could understand the psychology of all the people who did what they did. The uh, trouble is you can't. That's the Well, of course, said. this is why people <laughs> read novels, why yeah. people write yeah. novels, why people write yeah. history, why people study economy. They all think that somehow or other you're going to find out what makes people go. And now we know. I was I was talking to to uh, uh, Ed Purcell yesterday. Sure, a yeah. very bright guy. Oh right? yes, I know. And I know. he well. said that Star Wars can only be described by a nasty. Four letter <laughs> word. <laughs> hoax, he said. Hoax. H O A X. Oh, he didn't use the, <laughs> the four letter word. <laughs> well, I was waiting for the four yeah. letter word, you <laughs> mean. And so he, yeah. well, uh, I suppose, mm. but I've never seen uh, Ed Purcell bitter before. Well, I've seen him bitter, yeah. He's really bitter. Yeah. And, mm. uh, here we are, we are on a toboggan, and this, this uh, silly man, <coughs> like Decatur, going yes. in, into, into Tripoli. That's much more like yes. Decatur. I suppose yeah. there's a lot more in that. Yeah. The Barbary pirates are Barbary pirates, yeah. and, yeah. and You've got to you stop. have to be treated as pirates. That's right. That's more well, really I think there's a good deal in that, and I mm -hmm. think in that case his instinct is probably correct. I think his instincts are right, but his knowledge is often weak, I think. But, he's, but well, he cheers me up. He makes me feel good. <laughs> now, that's more important than Star Wars. Uh, you say <laughs> you feel good now, but how will you feel a year from now when you're bust? Uh, You'll go far if uh, you don't bust. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that <laughs> great classic. <laughs> <That> <laughs> classic <laughs> remark. You'll go far if you don't bust. Yeah. Well, uh, Exactly. You can you can drive that railway train right over a cliff. Yeah. It's great until you get to the cliff, or rather until you get over the cliff. I was interested to change the subject again a little bit because talking to Charlie Wysansky, he always has the greatest admiration for Nelson Perkins. And I thought he was a, a, a great guy in many ways. 
but I never mustered up, though I, of course I hardly knew him, but I never mustered up this degree of enthusiasm. Charlie Wysansk, who you really, he was in yes. Wilson Gray, really worships him. Well, my Did brother- Did you ever know him well oh, enough? Of course, I knew him very well. My brother Quincy and I always referred to him as the great father. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I think there's certain, certain dangers in being a great father. Oh, yes. Well, I'm uh, certainly not. No, I, I suppose it's something that, that uh, we ought to cultivate. We're now old enough to do it. Is a rather slow and labored waiting between words to express. We won't <laughs> ever know ourselves. <laughs> 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 but you certainly must by now have an interesting story about dialect. Uh, a week ago, my wife and I, as is, has been long our custom, were sitting in the front row on a Saturday night at the Boston Symphony concert. And I noticed when we sat down that behind us was a very interesting family. They were clearly Indians from India, the lady of the family had that mark they wear in their forehead of high Brahmin. caste. Brahmin. Brahmin. They were Brahmins, Hindus. Oh. And uh, a gentleman, uh, very intelligent looking. And then what really interested us were two children. One appeared to be about 10 years old and a little boy, and there was a girl of, of maybe 12 or 13. So when the intermission came, I got into conversation with the children. Yeah. And I asked them if they played instruments. And yes, they played, this, the boy played the violin and, and uh, the girl played the piano. And then I discovered that the girl also played the violin and the boy played the piano. Oh. And so they were obviously very musical. And we had a pleasant conversation. And then, the father said, after listening and looking at me with curiosity for a few minutes, uh, just then the girl said, do you live here? You have a, a foreign accent. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, uh, <laughs> <I> live here. <laughs> I've been if here. You can for call it living. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I've <laughs> been here uh, for about yeah. 350 years. My family <laughs> came over with the first load of bricks. Yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> then the man said, "The father, do you do you know a man called John Adams, who works for Digital?" Oh yes. Sure. And I said, why is that I know him. interesting? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's my eldest son. He said, he and I are colleagues. We work together in the mathematics of, <laughs> of the computer, but it's a bit like me. And yet he, this man picked up the fact that we spoke the same accent, the same dialect. Yeah. Well, that means he had... I suppose if you're an Indian and you're listening to X different X numbers of different dialects, yes, I yes. suppose that it. But one thing I remember you're telling me in my dim, dark youth about uh, linguistics, and that is you told me that your grandfather said that he and an educated Englishman of his time really talked exactly the same way. I remember that. Do you remember that? Because mm. you told and it I, That me. story, my father told me Your that. Father. He was talking about uh, when Lord Bryce came and stayed with, oh, with yeah, my grandfather yeah. at Lincoln. And, and he said that they, they might as well have gone to the same school. Go, yeah. Although, of course, they were totally different. Yeah, and totally they, different. But the Oxford uh, overdeveloped style hadn't. Had the developed. Oxford style. The, the, the exaggerated style of the, of the Oxford Englishman is so impossible. Yeah. Uh, what is his name? Uh, uh, 
the, uh, you know, the fellow I'm thinking of, the, the um, Israel, no, Isaiah uh, Berlin. Berlin yes. He's the damnedest fellow to talk to I've ever known. You're a dialect. I consider myself speaking the Brahmin dialect of Boston. But the word Brahmin is a very difficult word to define, and it wasn't, in fact, invented by until uh, until Oliver Wendell Holmes in the middle yes. of the last century. I speak pure English, not Brahmin dialect. You are infected by Grattan. No, I don't think so at you all. Don't think so? Uh, How did you get purer mother, than I? Well, I got purer than I because. <laughs> <laughs> The great difference is this, that the George's family uh, are Bostonians. Can't help them, they can't help it. Uh, <laughs> they, George is infected with the bad blood of the Crown and Shields, and it goes way, way back. But actually, up to the time when our great-grandfather married uh, a Brooks, there was no bad, my father used to tell me this frequently, there was no bad Boston blood in the family. They were all blousy southerners. Though. Well, they were everything you can think <laughs> of. There was, there was uh, uh, my father was- Baltimore and all that. Yeah, uh, you see, John Adams married a girl from Weymouth. Yes, but that, um, <laughs> come on, let's not <laughs> well, make too the, fine the distinctions. distinctions yeah. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. their, uh, their son, uh, whatever he was, great-great-grandfather, uh, married a Baltimore girl, mm. and... But she's just as much my ancestress as yours. yours. Exactly, we're getting it. You see, you were not Bostonian until then. Then great-grandfather Charles Francis married, married a Brooks, and that was... Well, so did... Well, we the, go again. Where, yeah. All right, the taint comes in at that point, George. But then your satanic. grandfather married a crown shield, which oh. is the worst blood in Boston. Oh, well, they were wicked, they wicked. They were wicked, bad people. Uh, yes. But my grandfather had the wisdom to go and marry a girl from Rhode Island whose mother, I think, came from New Orleans. Oh, well, now that would make So you see, you, we get had infected. an outcross yes, there. Yes, yes, then yes. Uh, your father, is a Homans, which is a very old Boston family. Dorchester married. is our <laughs> ultimate But home. my father <laughs> went out west and married. That might have, going out west might have made a difference. Made a whale of a difference. No. Mm. Uh, married, uh, it was a New England families, but from far away, Jamaica yeah. Plain and and uh, New Bedford yeah. had gone out but west. It, but, they were, but they were out west. So yeah. that, that mother was born in Topeka, Kansas, and I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. Well, that makes a whale of a difference, George. Yes, that does. That ruins <laughs> you. <yeah. laughs> you see? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that all we have is the, is the pure accent brought down generation after generation. From the Kansas from City Stockyards. From the Kansas City Stockyards. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh. I have. I have, yes, because people don't know the difference. They don't know, they don't the, difference, know the difference. They don't know the difference. They just uh, some people from the South, for instance, have mistaken me for English. Uh, when I went out west in, during the war, and I was in the army out there, uh, I was fascinated. Uh, they would say, "Well, you come from back east?" I said, "Well, yes, I do." And then they'd say, "Well." So did my people, they came from Missouri. No. <laughs> well, I've had the reverse thing said that uh, um, I was a fellow of, an Oxford, of a Cambridge college for a while, and I remember they are saying to me, why do you speak so much more like us? It's the other <laughs> way. They didn't say I spoke but exactly. Like, yeah, no. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> You should have come to lunch today, Joel. Well, you couldn't, but there were three Englishmen at lunch today. Oh, really? It was rather amusing because they had totally different accents, all three of them. Well, you can get a range if you go from the west of England through the Midlands up Yo. to the north. You can get an awful long range. Yeah. Can you get a range like that in Boston? Well, yes, oh, yes because yes. 
the good old South Boston accent, where which I, because they'd lost their lovely Irish brogue, and they took up this, this language that includes a, that word I hate called dance. Dance, yeah. Yes, dance. Now, dance, we say. It's extraordinary how, how rapidly these things change and disappear, but... But uh, the brogue is gone, the and brogue yet it was is one gone, of the most it, beautiful accents. It, it was very, yeah. very common. And I remember it in my youth, and I loved it, you know. All our... Uh, i tell you somebody, are. curiously, who has, has that accent today. Is, is, do you know him? Uh, Liam Williams, who is no, the, the I assistant don't know. head of the, of the Boston Public Library, a charming, attractive fellow. He must be straight from the old country. Yeah. But he has that pure, beautiful brogue. Brogue, well, terrific, Cal. Yeah. It's a lovely, lovely accent. Do you think there are many people in Boston who speak like you two gentlemen did? Oh, we're a dwindling group. They're dwindling. We are, we are a declining group. Uh, but I think there may be as many as a thousand. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Out of I, Six hundred thousand. Yeah. I, I often <laughs> wonder because because I'm getting old and deaf, but I cannot understand my grandchildren when they speak. Oh, they they they, they jumble all their words together. They talk very fast, and I can't understand what the devil they're saying. But I think our parents must have probably felt. The I same think way. that is probably yeah. a problem of, of, of children speaking. Yeah. I, I can understand my own children still, but, and I think that they speak somewhat the way I do, but my wife, of course, speaks exactly the way I do, or I speak exactly the way she does. Now, she's a straight... She had some southern... She has southern... Influence, yeah. Her mother came from Charleston. Mm -hmm. I think the southern does something to the, to the Yankee accent. It softens it in some way. But you, yep. you don't think your grandchildren have your it's hard to tell now because the eldest is only 13 and the youngest is, is what? Four or five. You or really something. can't tell it's because you don't know how you, s you yourself sound. This, is, this fascinates yeah. me. Now, for instance, if I was to hear uh, your tape come back, I wonder who that chump was talking. Yeah, well, I told them the story about me when I gave the talk on the BBC and I said after his played back how awful I sounded, and they said, oh, don't worry, interesting folk accent. <laughs> Shh, that was one up and ship. <laughs> <laughs> well, it must be that as you speak, you project your voice, and when it comes back to you, it sounds entirely different. It sounds different, it does. But George is quite right, uh, uh, in spite of myself, and, and, and I never cared very much for Groton School, but there was one great teacher there, and as great Uncle Henry once remarked, the teacher affects eternity. He never can tell where his influence stops. No, but also Groton had some teachers who were good teachers, and uh, one of them was a relative of Nancy's and so on, who had been brought up in the English style of talking, yes. you know, which was not true at my school. Well, now, Sherrod Billings, well, interestingly, right. grew up in Quincy, our hometown, but he had the most perfect accent I've ever heard. And he, one of the, the few things that I took away from Groton was his instructions when we were in class with him. He used to say, Never raise your voice. Speak with the tongue against the teeth. Use your lips. The St. Marcus, that was the rival school, can hear me cheering <laughs> across the field. <laughs> they cannot hear you speaking to us boys. Uh, and there was very little drama and almost no fun at Groton School when I was there. But I got a lot of drama and uh, a lot of fun out of St. Paul's. <laughs> well, I never did. Equivalent kind of school. But, but uh, 
on Sunday evening, the old idea, you went to church twice a day on Sunday, it was, it was high Episcopal, but uh, on Sunday evening, Mr. Billings read the lesson. And the shadows lengthen, the and evening the evening form, comes, and the busy, busy world, world is hushed, and the, and the fever, fever of life is over, and our work, work is done. done. Grant us a safe lodging, lodging and a holy and rest, peace. and peace, peace at the last. last. Yes. You had the same deal as we did, obviously. And, uh, but most of all, uh, with the high drama, there is a, the story of, of, of Elijah and I never can remember whether it's Elijah or Elisha, it doesn't make any difference, but Naaman, the captain of the host, who came to be cured of his leprosy. Both unconsciously influenced by the Book of Common Prayer and the Bible. We certainly were. As produced by the Episcopal Church, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Can we borrow you for just two more minutes? Yes. Oh, my God. Um, you're in a rush. I want to get God. <laughs> <laughs> it could be called. Do that over again, and you can continue just talking. With the All right. Minutes. You want me to repeat it? Yes, please. Yeah. My name is Tom Adams. I live in Lincoln, Massachusetts, which is the town that lies between Concord and Lexington, and most of the Battle of Lexington, so-called, and Concord, occurred in Lincoln in 70, on the 19th of April, 1775, on the Battle Road as it runs through Lincoln. <laughs> George is bored with this, but I'm going to bore him more before we're all dead. <laughs> okay, let's let's try let's try that. Try this time to say something personal about yourself. Okay, the, the same the same procedure. You just you can you can mute that and then continue on to say something else. Or start at the beginning. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. Start the whole thing all over again. All right. Name, your name, and name. All right. <laughs> Name and address. My name, should I tell them what about the Battle Road? You can do that again. Is that all right? I'm very, very proud of that fact. Uh, I live, uh, my name is Tom Adams. I live. Get a clear start, I'm sorry. Okay. All over again? Yes, please. My name is Tom Adams. I live in Lincoln, Massachusetts, which is the town that lies between Concord and Lexington, and it is the actual place where the fighting occurred on the 19th of April, 1775, along the road as it passes through Lincoln. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. My mother was born in Topeka, Kansas. My father was born in Quincy, Massachusetts. I have lived in Lincoln, excepting for the war years, since I was three years old. I've been engaged in a great variety of occupations. I started my literary life professionally working for the Boston Herald in 1931. I left that because I was starving to death in the Great Depression and went to work for the Waltham Watch Company. I left the Waltham Watch Company to join the United States Army Air Force in 19... Uh, my name is George Casper Homans. I give them the full name, unlike yourself. I was born in Boston in 1910 on Beacon Street, a house that is still standing. I attended schools in Boston and, and in Cambridge and then went to uh, St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire. Then, as my ancestors did, I went to Harvard College. Uh, after Harvard College, after a couple of years of unemployment, I became what is called a junior fellow at Harvard, which is an academic position. After that, I had a 
brief period as an instructor in Harvard. Then I was, uh, because I was an ROTC student, I was called in the United States Navy and served there for four and a half years and came back to Harvard first as an assistant, then as a full uh, associate, then as a full professor, and that's where I've been ever since. I married Nancy Parshall. American Tongues was supported by a grant from the National Council for the Human. Am I a free man? No, 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 no,